Hello everybody, it's Adam Heard with 973 Ramp, and this is the second video for the arm elevator combo where we are going to look at sizing and elevator. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to steal some of the calcs from here, so we'll steal the motor spec. Let's say we're using the other two bags that are presumably legal based on last year's rules for the elevator, and then we're going to make the calcs differently from here. So I'm not going to drive this in front of you guys, but a elevator essentially has, is, is very similar to a drivetrain actually in that you're using a rotational device that could be a drum if you're doing cable it could be a sprocket if you are doing a chain it could be a pulley if you are doing belt it could be a gear if you're doing rack and pinion some way to convert rotary motion to linear motion and I've got a lot of questions actually in the last week so I feel like maybe other people are thinking it might be an arm elevator game too on that part. Now, people were kind of missing what the magic of an elevator is and how do you calculate stuff and it's that. At some point in your system you're converting rotary motion to linear. You need to figure out what that is. You need to figure out the diameter or the radius of that and that's what you use as your calculation. Uh, well not the only thing you use but you'll see how that comes up. So. I'm going to come in and grab gear ratio again. Uh, call it gearbox because you know you will have some gearbox maybe, but I know it's going to be less stages, so we're going to delete uh, these rows. And I'll just call this uh, initial final. And then the next step is that I'm going to call it drum diameter, but uh, it could be anything. It could be a gear. Uh, I guess what I'll do right now is actually model our prototype elevator from 2011 that we ran on Emperor Swerve. Uh, I, you, if you are interested in the layout of that, there's that first video I posted about five minutes long doing the pairing setup, and I'm going to do a couple videos on that focusing on how we did the power transmission physically, and that'll match up with this here, actually. So, actually, I know then that there's only one stage gear reduction, and that was 9 to 96, and that was actually with 550s, so we're going to change to that. Uh, I think that's like 68.85 by 16. If I'm wrong there, please forgive me. 85, number of motors, 2. Okay, so back to this. So our jump diameter in that case was actually a 9 tooth, uh, 12 DP pinion, I want to say. Uh, so if I'm wrong, we will discover that in our math pretty quickly, probably. And how you get the diameter of that actually is that'll be the number of teeth divided by 12 times pi, I want to say. Let's see if that works out. No, it's is it divided by pi? I'm really tired right now. I'm sorry, guys. I am way wrong. I'm sorry. This is really embarrassing. I should have got this a little earlier. I'm a little tired today. So if it was 12 teeth, the diameter would be 1, actually. Oh, so the diameter is 9 divided by 12. OK, no pi involved. Wow. Um, shocking actually that I got that wrong. I'm really sorry guys. But I hope that teaches people that everyone is human. That actually leads me into a really off topic point. I actually got a couple feedback emails of some people complaining that I clearly do not have a plan when I'm making these videos and that I ramble a lot. But more so I got uh, compliments aren't the right word because they weren't compliments. But people were glad to see that I ramble and I make mistakes and I iterate and guess stuff all the time because people had the misconception that I guess I do things perfectly, which is crazy because I screw up all the time. Ask any of my kids that. Uh, it happens a lot. So we'll get back on topic. But yeah, uh, so I'm kind of glad that I can bring some... Not sure what we're to use this, so we're just going to move on. <laughs> so we're going to combine this as a linear motor now. And then you're going to get a free speed in, I guess we'll go with inches a second and we're going to get a stall force actually in pounds. And this makes this math a little more complicated and since I've not planned this or derived this by hand, usually I sit down and do hand calcs before I do this stuff and like I said, no plan for these videos so we're just going to do this and hopefully you guys see me make some mistakes. Hopefully not though. So free speed, we're going to take the free speed of the motor divided by that gear ratio times the diameter of the drum times pi, because that gets you the circumference, uh, and divided by 60 to get per second. 71 inches a second, that looks good. Stall force is going to be this times the number of motors times the gear ratio. In a torque equals force times distance, so force equals torque divided by distance. In this case, distance is half the diameter, so we're going to divide by 0.5 times that. 
stall force at 244 pounds. These numbers are looking familiar. Um, okay, come on. Uh, why are you not highlighting? Oh, there we go. Oh, I forgot an important factor for our elevator. It is a cascade elevator, and I thought I had a picture ready for that. I did not. I will link a picture in the comment section of this video to uh, the rigging of a cascade elevator, and there's also the other video I did in the elevator, and I'll do some more. But essentially, uh, you power the first stage. Uh, I accidentally call that the second stage a lot, so I guess I'll call that second stage. Second stage is our large frame that moves, and as that moves up, that separately causes the carriage move in relation to that, so you actually get a two to one gear ratio, though, in terms of the carriage. So I'll do number of number of cascade stages. Because really you're concerned with the end of your elevator, so that'll be two. So what that actually does with these numbers is scales them, so it's actually and then your force is divided by it. Uh, now we need some system weights. And I actually like to put four weights in here and I'll explain what they are as we're doing it. So we'll go with carriage weight. This is the final stage of the elevator. Uh, the second stage. This is the large stage that uh, is between the rigid stage and holds the second stage. This is spring force on carriage. So this is if you have any springs pulling the carriage to the top of the second stage. And this is spring force on second. And often you won't have both. I have seen a couple teams do both. And I understand why, because they only sell a certain number of gas springs. So you might need to do that to get the exact balance you want. I'm sorry, gas springs not what I was looking for. Constant force springs. And I uh, should have said this earlier, but I think if you're making an elevator, especially a cascade one, you should use constant force springs to counterbalance it because it's such a free effect and it's just cool. I mean, it, I think it shows a higher level of understanding of the forces and math involved and uh, it's just cool. So let's say our carriage is 12 pounds because we've got like a claw on it. Second stage is only like four, uh, maybe it's like five. Uh, these are from memory, I know it was two years ago, but I think this is pretty close. Actually zero spring force on the carriage and there was 40 pounds of spring force on the second. And that is that 40 is what actually was, so if we find out these numbers don't work out, I'm going to come back and cheat the system weights. So then I'm going to do a combined net force, or combined weight, at carriage. Now this is one I'm definitely not going to show the hand calcs for. If there's a lot of demand, I will do hand calcs by hand and post them as an attachment to this video, I guess. But essentially what this will be is that minus this times 2, because your cascade stage, uh, I'm sorry, plus that times 2, my apologies, minus that, minus that times 2. And if you get negative, that means you are counterbalanced completely, so we're just going to cheat and increase this until that number gets 0. So we actually probably weren't exactly perfect, but uh, we had it to where within, what am I getting this wrong for? Is it 17.5 then? There we go. We had this elevator essentially neutrally counterbalanced to where within friction. So it actually wasn't a perfect net force, but friction held it. So what's cool about this is uh, we can actually show that uh, you'll operate at free speed. And that's not quite true because you do have to accelerate the system and you have friction, but you will, uh, Those are transient effects, and you, you essentially will hit free speed if your elevator's long enough. But more importantly, we're just showing the load required to hold this up will actually be zero, because we can now do our percent stall stuff. So percent stall that divided by this big force, no surprise, is zero. Uh, percent free equals one minus that, and no surprise, that'll be one. So then speed in inches a second will be that. Um, we should probably factor in efficiency there. So I'm going to make the efficiency 0.9 squared. That's probably lower than what it was. 0.9 uh, as 90% and squared because we have two stages. So this will be times that efficiency. And that's technically not the greatest way to do efficiency, but it certainly is great for FRC. Uh, certainly overkill if we do anything else. Um, and you can see things like, well, I have this 40 pound constant force spring, so things are great. I essentially have zero current draw, yada yada. But uh, what if I got rid of that? and you'll see that 
you know, even then, elevators are pretty good. However, I wouldn't want to carry around 550s at 16% stall the entire match. So I think, since it's so easy to, you might as well counterbalance. And like I said, it's cool. So, put that back in there. Um, you can see that we're getting, well, maybe let's put this in feet a second now for people who want that. But you can see that's just under 12, 10 feet a second. And that worked out pretty well for us. This, I would not do your math though, like, oh, elevator height in feet and go eight feet and then go, oh, well, then this time in seconds must be that divided by that. Well, that's assuming you're going free speed the whole time. You're not accelerating at all. Your control loops are perfect. Yada, yada. First, I'll say, do not make an elevator this fast if you cannot handle the control loops. If you think about it, uh, you know, most teams are probably operating about 50 to 100 hertz. That means you only have like 50 to 100 data points to go nine or eight feet, which is not a lot. Uh, certainly you can do it, but if it's your first PID loop, this is not what you want. You would want to come in and go, I'm gonna cheat and just say there's another five to one stage and go, I want the elevator, yeah, right there, two seconds, or I'm sorry, that's wrong. Cool, this would be a much more controllable elevator. It goes four feet a second, that's still pretty darn fast. Gets up in that time, uh, maybe something more like that would be good, or even that for most games. But this is what we had. Um, so this number actually was higher, though, because you did have to accelerate and decelerate. And you do lose some speed because uh, it's pretty hard to have a PID loop that is the provably optimal fastest response, especially with the number of data points we have. And at that time, we were using nonlinear victors, you know, a lot of little things that added up to make that a harder thing to do. So cool. So these are the calcs for the elevator that you guys all saw in the CAD, or assuming you saw it. And uh, similar calcs would hold true for most elevators. If you're doing a continuous elevator, like 254, and I don't know who else has done a continuous elevator, you would make the number of cast st stages one, and then uh, instead of doing these separate weights, you would just do your carriage plus second combined. Uh, for half your travel, you're not actually raising your second stage, but you might as well, since the second is probably much lighter than your carriage, believe it or not, uh, you might as well just lump it into one weight, and then uh, spring force would just be acting directly, and your n n uh, net weights is a lot easier because you just add carriage in second, minus your spring force, makes that a lot easier. All right, so I hope somebody or everybody learned something here. If there's any questions or feel that I didn't provide enough detail on these calcs, let me know, and I will hand calc stuff. Um, and I also will post a link to a picture of a cascade rigged elevator versus continuous. And I guess also actually there's a recent workshop I saw, at least within the last two years, that Paul Copioli did. And it was probably the best one I had seen recently on arms and elevators and a lot of little things in there. And I believe it was filmed actually. So when I find that, I will put that in the comments of this video. All right, have a good one, everybody.